Hello everyone and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, episode 11 of season 3. Now, we have a guest today of Casey Hupke. We'll be bringing him on in just a second. Before we do, I want to do a quick heads up. Um, extra, keep an extra eye out for audio levels. I kind of everything because I... It, the streaming software has been crashing on me lately. It's been freezing up. So I downloaded a new version and rebuilt my entire interface again from scratch. So audio levels might be all over the place. So feel free to give me a heads up on any issues along those lines. And my cinema has been, I don't know what's up. Well, I mean, my computer's being a little bit weird today, but hopefully everything can work out. In any case, without wasting any time, let's go ahead and bring up our guest this week of Casey Hupke. Welcome, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, happy to be here. This is uh, this is one of the fun times that I get to hop on a stream and talk nerdy. It yes. feels like the last like two years of uh, me being in the Maxon family has just been coming on Maxon streams to make fun of Beeple why he does dailies. <laughs> that that is a popular time to go and hang out. Um, yeah. But uh, you joined us last time when R twenty three came out and we explored a little bit of node stuff and that is the plan again today. Uh, Casey's having a couple internet issues, so he is actually joining us via tethered, being tethered to his phone. So we'll, we'll probably spend most of our time on my computer, but Casey will be throwing out lots of questions and ideas and solutions as we go and. I think Rick is going to be paying attention to us as well, so we can get uh, answers from him as that goes. I'll keep an eye on that in the uh, chat as well. And possibly we can even pull Rick in, at least audio-wise, but maybe additional. But we'll be making up as we go, so we'll just have to see how it happens. So how is everyone doing? Well, before, I guess the usual thing we do would be uh, having the guest show a bunch of like your portfolio and whatnot. But without your screen being up, maybe I can pull up. Do you have a particular website I can pop up on the screen here? Oh, uh, yeah, just xkcx.com. xkcx.com. Two X's. Let me see if it pop, pops up. Okay, it pops up. Let me share the screen. That's my desk plus guest. Let's see if this works. So one of the new bits of setup, yeah. One of the new best bits of setup is it might take an extra split second to flip the screens, but... Um, it's not keeping everything in memory, so hopefully that helps solve any issues with uh, with it crashing. But anyway, yeah, Casey's got like a ton of work. You've been doing kick-ass Cinema 4D things for years. Uh, you've always gone like crazy deep into particle type things. If you want to uh, to narrate anything or have me click anything in particular, feel free to uh, have me steer. Oh uh, no, I mean, yeah, I just I work on a lot of abstract particle-y data busy stuff i think i've you know i've gosh like 15 years now i think doing this um this was a really fun one we did it with bmo and my friends chris and rhino um we handled uh, a lot of like the data busy stuff on the second piece um where it's all like the data viz and uh, oh did this end shot just like an octane render camera thing um but it was really fun uh, working with Brandon Parvini and the other brand in BMO. Uh, but yeah, that one of the things that I've sort of become known for with Chris and Two and Flow, uh, or uh, Two and Flow Chris and uh, the Decoy Flux fam, is uh, shipping final renders using the Cinema 4D viewport oh, or yeah. Houdini viewport. That's sort of like <laughs> been our thing. It's like, yeah, it's super generative looking. Hey, this is this viewport. And that was probably the first big, big break project that I worked on. That working on this with all the team at Motion Theory was what landed me um, the first uh, Maxon NAB presentation I ever gave. I was going to say, um, I remember the presentation here where you, you were talking about explosion effect, or uh, the poly effects because of how quick it calculates. Yeah, it was poly effects was absolutely just instrumental to that whole project. Um, and it was kind of wild, like looking at the other stuff that the other packages that were in the studio at that time, because I think this is 2000. 10 or something no 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 before that uh when was it 2010 or 2009 i don't know it was a long time ago the cinema 40 10 i think had just or 11 it was so long ago um but yeah it was crazy in the viewport you could shatter a you know heavily subdivided uh cad model of a car with mograph effectors and put it back together and yeah, everyone else was just yeah, the, looking at it like, how'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the unique thing about the poly effects is that is it is a deformer, so it's just moving around points and polygons, where pretty much everything else in MoGraph has to explode everything out 
into different objects. So if you have a thousand objects, cinema doesn't like it. But if you have a thousand polygons, it's like, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, we ended up I, like at Motion Theory and at a bunch of other studios after the fall, like falling in love with poly effects, we would do things where we would like, you know, uh, collapse all objects and uh, turn them into one object and then just use poly effects on it. Uh, this was a monster project with uh, Jake Sargent um, for this company and ProtectWise that's now, I believe, just a part of Verizon as a whole. Um, Ranger and Fox ha handled this video. Um, I was working on this for about 18 months before this, um, just on like the stuff that's up at the top, like the just coming up with this like 3D uh, city. Um, but this was super cool. Um, but yeah, this was uh, a, a VR experience for this company named ProtectWise. Um, Jake Sargent had worked well with them for years to create a front end um, for this security analytics tool and uh, dashboard that like analyzed your full network. And he tapped me at one point and was like, hey, we want to they're going to make my interface in VR. Do you want to work on this? And I was like, yes. So for like 18 months, Jake and I just sort of like, you know, tried very, 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 very hard not to just recreate what I would hope I would get called on to do the title sequence for a reboot of hackers. I'm wearing my hacker shirt right now, in fact. <laughs> Someone has to know someone who's working on a spec or a screenplay for the reboot of that film. And like, oh, man, I need to, I need to be on that title sequence team. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you've been doing like really great work. You do you get really technical and down in the weeds and things, which is just definitely something I like. Um, and with that, let's see how everybody in the chat is doing. I pull up, put us back on screen. And yeah, we've got all the regulars, Pro Tools and Spear Factory, Rogue, Mr. Matt Dog, Crossfader, Chris, hello, Motion Trash, Tobias, uh, Salam, hello, welcome. Uh, I'm not sure how to say that one. Hello, that's a new person. <laughs> uh, Kakzka, I'm not sure. Uh, Shane, of course, Casey's there in the chat as well, Muse Tree. Um, v Ruckus, uh, Prism, hello, hello, Mick, and we got people on YouTube, Scott, and um, Twirl, Jasper, RBLX, Mo, Brian. Um, Ooh, that's that's my best friend, Brian Wade Scott, Rick. right there. Yeah, oh, excellent. Uh, Jeremy, Bobby, Jamie, more people popping up every second. Thanks for coming and hanging out, everybody. Um, we do not have any kind of a plan today. We are just going to open up. Here we are in S24. We're just going to pop it open and start talking about it. So uh, I guess I'll show my screen immediately. And here we are in S24. Both of us are on screen. We should be able to just start tinkering. So there's a lot of concepts that you and I have not. Well, I mean, when it comes to nodes, it's going to be really, really deep. This is still only the second iteration of this from Maxon. It's important to put this out in front that this is not considered production ready yet, but it's They've added new features, one of the main ones being the scene manager. And there are new nodes and some new workflows and new tools within it. Um, but we're just going to go and uh, tinker around. So uh, feel free at any point, Casey, to interject and be like, oh, what about this? Let's try this. Let's do something crazy. Um, and yeah, start building. So. I think one of the well, like the first thing to point out is that they've done a huge update to it in a lot of the nodes and contexts like with the different operators that exist, as you're going to see, there's like multiple sort of contexts that are sort of being built around right now. And like with no internal knowledge at all of Maxon, I, I don't know anything. I have no inside information, but there's, which I think I said a bunch on the last uh, stream too. There's little tells that are in here that show that there, this is still like, like technical preview is like a generous term. This is a work in progress for sure. We'll just look at the uh, lack of icons. That's all the yeah. exact same icon, only dual mesh, which I think was made by Rick, um, has an icon. So those aren't getting built out that way yet. Um, uh, a couple of scene some, manager. Whew. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's give some quick context. First of all, you have to go to your layout nodes to see this general layout. And now, uh, there's two main ways of getting to different nodes. One is hitting the letter C, which will pop open 
the kind of quick command manager and you can be in nodes or in operators or the other and I actually like doing it this way is opening up the asset browser and then I had been saying go to nodes but this will show material nodes and scene nodes and I just want the scene nodes so you click on operators and you'll see just things that are relevant to this type of setup in addition to that I like changing to list view and shrinking it all the way so I can you kind of see everything alphabetically very clean dominated by text and it's not like these icons are very informative right now anyway but like yeah like you said they've started organizing this in a much more intuitive way mainly these four folders of generators primitive modifiers primitives and selections and then the very important asset construction which i'm only starting to wrap my mind around uh, then we have the scene manager which is completely bright blank right now but we'll be talking about that for sure and then a huge one is they added this scene root in here as a floating node where in the past it had been this big black bar on the side which just ate up so much of the the visual space here and especially with us live streaming or recording a tutorial I, i'm kind of stuck on one monitor here so we really have to squeeze everything in to see as much as possible so those are that the, the scene route is a, a really important thing in addition to that you can automatically add as many children to this as you want it's kind of like this top one this ch children is the scene and then everything else is a series of children you can see if i select that i can click add input and we can just keep adding more children can you right click to add those i i also do the the attribute manager style, style like click but I, I wasn't sure how if there was a easier way to add children. Um, uh, I, well, that'd be something I'd love to see would be the ability to right click here and say add children. And let me try adding a primitive. Like if you just drag a node into it, I wonder if it collides and leaves you the option. Um, let's see, I think we need a primitive. Is that an operator? Yeah, that's an operation. That's the option. So, yeah, so that would be a child and that'll appear in the scene. But could we drag this into nothing? Well, that's to the top, and then, yeah, some <laughs> weird things just happened there. I'm going to hit undo because I'm not sure what that was. Uh, we saw so. the source code. We have the source. <laughs> um, but you, you now see as soon as I plug this into the scene, in the scene manager, there is now a cube. So that is one little thing. I guess let me let me just demo quickly and once again interject wherever you want to. Let's just do a quick demo of the scene manager for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, because this is the beginnings of the future of where cinema is going. This scene manager is going to essentially be the replacement of the object manager eventually. That's the idea, yes. I think. And it's it, it actually it's super cool. And it's as we're going as Chris is going through this, like there's going to be things like you notice you drop your primitive and you immediately get your your scene root. Uh, is it has the primitive attached to it in the node manager and everything that we do to this cube inside of here is going to replicate itself in nodes so you're kind of you're already like you're getting free value out of a both like there's a way to build in the scene manager and have it reflect in the node manager and vice versa but the node manager to scene manager is still very confusing to me and i haven't quite figured out how to do that yet <laughs> yes um, yeah, we were just chatting about that a little bit before the stream, but you'll see as I drag in different geometry primitives that they are appearing here and instantly becoming linked to the scene root. And I, it looks like it's actually creating, see, we've got our one through seven, but if I add another one on here, it actually is automatically creating another one. So that's another instant way of adding more. And then we can select and delete. Another addition is it, because we're in this scene manager context, I now have the ability to move it in the viewport select it in the viewport and you'll see that the different properties of it appear as we sort of expect in the object manager then yeah the ability to move or scale or rotate that we couldn't do that before but now it is interfacing in the viewport in a very handy way um, but let's keep this simple and just create this cube and start talking about the modifier stack so going into geometry modifier, we can now make changes to this cube or any geometry that we feed in simply by dragging these modifiers directly as a child. So in this case, what's something good to do? I'm going to hit NB so you can, see, you can see all the polygons. And I know we could subdivide it here. But let's begin by subdividing the entire thing. So drag in a subdivide. And you'll see it is now subdivided by one. We could turn on smoothing so that this is actually kind of rounding it out or just subdivide. Sub sub <clears throat> subdividing it flat but the thing you should notice right away is that the modifier went above the object yes 
So this is this is the <laughs> write strangest your person now. Yeah, write your this is person this now. <laughs> strangest and most unintuitive thing, and I don't know how locked in this is, but I think both Casey and I are of the opinion that unless you want to alienate every single Cinema 4D user, it needs to go the opposite way. People do not read from bottom to top. People read from top to bottom. Um, but you'll see that now that I have subdivided, if I wanted to, I could triangulate and I actually put that above the subdivide. So first the subdivide happened and then the triangulate. Now, like I said, this is probably not locked in, but yeah, I think we're both putting our vote in for this uh, being reversed. But we now have a stack of objects and I'll just throw in a few more modifiers in here. Do another subdivide. We'll have that one round. Then how about, I'll just do an extrude, why not? It's rounded now. Yeah, where is extrude? Throw an extrusion in there. They all get extruded. Of course, there's tons of different properties in here. We can have to extrude out really far. We could do some offset variation. And very quickly, we start getting a pretty crazy looking object and it's all parametric because it's all node-based. You'll see as I add them in, they are appearing here in the node manager, but they all get visually messed up. However, if I hit the shortcut Shift L, it'll just organize every node in the entire scene and kind of line them up. So that can help. You can also just, if you had just a couple messed up, let's say I had these two way out there, I can just hit L and just those two get fixed, which can be very handy. So now we can see the relationships that were built here and we can rearrange them here. They'll rearrange the way they're connected there. A, a lot of really interesting combinations of things. So uh, my first thought is, and I don't know how well this will go, but my first thought was if we play with the dual mesh modifier, which is the thing that I think was made by Rick. And what this does is it's a single standalone object, but you see it turned this cube into like this crazy geometry. And I think that we could try That's and make one. something like that um, and then wrap it up. So it would then kind of appear in this list. That is, I think a good exercise for like, okay, let's build something in the scene manager. Yeah, and then uh, clean up the nodes and then wrap it up in a package to then kind of complete the loop. Yeah, uh, someone asked, someone just asked in the YouTube chat, can you select like one vertex or polygon in a view? Um, I think uh, uh, selections are a, good, are a really cool thing to, to, to show in the scene manager too while we're doing that. Uh, Cause it's, it's very simple and they're actually like in a lot of ways, like much better. <laughs> Well, I mean, we can't select, uh, there's no, I don't think there's any kind of make editable right now. And no. so this can't be made editable and we can go to our different display modes, but it's not really going to be doing anything. Like if I go to select here, you see that this isn't doing anything, but it's all procedural selection right now. I mean, obviously, eventually they'll be able to, able to be made editable. However, let's go back to polygon mode and yeah, maybe this cube, I'll subdivide it a few times so we can get, see a little bit of variety there. And going to geometry selection, now we have an entire collection of ways to select things. So an obvious one would be a random selection. Um, yeah, so there's a random selection interjected. It's got a couple different settings, change it to polygon mode. And as long as I have the polygon selected, the actual object, the top or the geometry, you'll actually see it represented here in the viewport. You can actually see the random selection that's been created. Um, so if we were to, let's do the random selection, selecting that, I can lower the percentage down. I would love to, maybe there's a way of doing it, but I'd love to lock it in. Or here's what I really want. We've got the stack, but as I select the random selection, I can't see what's selected anymore because I'm no longer on the object. I'd love for right. anything in the stack to act as if you had the cube selected as far as the viewport is concerned. That would be really great. But um, I have a very small percentage selection. As you see, there's just a couple. But now, and let me show you another neat thing. I could grab the expand selection and drag it over. But if I hold down control, I can create a duplicate of this. And this is a selection. It's a geometry selection. That's like a type of node, which means the selection operator, I copy this random selection, but I can change any selection type to any other selection type. And this is where we should be able to make more of these. But in this case, I could say, actually, this random selection should really be an expand selection. And now it is changed to be an expand selection. It's expanding the polygons by one, meaning my smaller selection has now grown and it's selected the polygons around it. Yeah. Really cool if you want to do like a growing selection or like a, a pseudo fake infection thing. 
<clears throat> there there is technically like at the core level what I how I would describe this is effectively there is one selection object and these are all presets that have been created. Uh, That's yeah. kind of how I was thinking of, thinking about it. I still yeah, want a just... plane selection. <laughs> a plane selection. Oh yeah, like the the empty <laughs> one. The um, yeah. well, I, what I want is a select all. We do not have a select all right now. So uh, via the, kind of these node operators. Yeah, um, that's what I mean for a plane selection. Like just like a, just plain zero or all. <laughs> yeah, zero all invert. Um, now, there, I mean, even along those lines, it can be interesting. If I were to delete those, I think if I put in an invert selection right in the beginning and select it, you see it's all selected because we had nothing selected. By inverting it now, I have everything, but it's not the same. There's a bunch of workarounds for doing it, but the. Um, but anyway, let me hit undo and bring back those two. Okay, it looks like I might have killed the undo state. That's fine. I'll just bring the random selection back in and the expand selection. The bookmarks are really cool too. Yeah, like that's being what I'm able about to show. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there's no, but yeah, it's a good point. I definitely don't want to miss that because we've got these. Well, let's put in just as a way of making it very visual. I will subdivide this now. Actually, uh, I'm going to subdivide it first. So I'll subdivide everything, smooth it out. So now everything gets rounded a bit. And then we get the these selections happening. And then after that's happened, let's say then we want another extrusion to happen. So right now this is happening based on these settings. So we could constantly be, we could collapse a stack down. So now we just see the cube and the cube obviously has a bunch of additional properties down here. And we'd have to twirl it down, move inside, grab the different objects to change their individual settings. But something that's pretty cool is we can go to something like random selection and turn on this bookmark and you'll see it'll appear up on the top almost as if it's a tag. And so we've kind of promoted that to being like, oh, that's an important element. And we can promote the expand selection as well. And I mean, in this case, we could promote pretty much everything, collapse it down because we don't have that big of an object. And I can select any one of these and instantly those properties are getting selected. So I could, let's do a very small selection and then grow it zero. I love that these go to zero. That's really good. It can go from zero and then grow it once, grow it twice, grow it three times. You can see that instantly I can select any any combination here and we can do the different extrusions and we didn't have to go into the stack. This of course will be even better once they have individual icons, but yeah, these modifiers behaving as tags and being able to be bookmarked pretty, pretty cool. It's a good, it's a good way to see where things are going. Yeah, I really, no, I, it's uh, like, there's so much of this stack, man, uh, the scene manager, um, other than the fact that it's going the wrong direction and I will not rest until it is chi fixed. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you could probably, like if it stays going like this, I'm just going to wear shirts that are written completely upside down to any presentation I ever do going forward. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm going to start my but, presentation from back to front. Yeah. So here, here we are at the final result and now let's go to the process before it. Um, but this is like the kind of stuff that used to make me like sort of valuable on teams is, you know, people, I would make things in MoGraph and they would have these ridiculous Espresso setups inside of them. And then everyone would be like, well, no one can touch that file now. There's only like you and three other people here that you can, that know all that Espresso. And so then I would make an Espresso tag and create user data and interfaces and sliders that look just like those tags look now that you can create with quick little one shot histories. And I remember like Vegas in 2012, like, talking to Rick at Whiskey Downs, talking about nodes and Espresso 2 and like the future. And uh, it's so cool that it's actually here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Espresso 2. The, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's really exciting where it's going, but I guess we're, gonna, we're still going to harp on it. But the basic things like the direction here are like, well, okay, everybody will acknowledge that that's the way it is. But look, it's really cool to be able to promote things up into the uh, controls. Like, uh, I guess the uh, small counterpoint to put there or additional point is we've also got this cancel one. We can say, hey, don't just turn this aspect off of it. So that uh, is the what's what's the word I'm blanking. What would the name of this little button be? Not solo, but disable just disable, I suppose. Um, maybe there's an official cancel. term, but yeah, and I think these are bookmarks. Yeah, these are bookmarks and this would be disable checkboxes. But I love how easy it is to make those little. Like, like th th that setup right there is so simplified in the scene manager. Like, sure, you could do the same exact thing in R20, like with the, you know, uh, 
poly extrude or uh, with a extrude generator and uh, oh, what's I'm blanking on the MoGraph extrude Mo extrude Mo right extrude. yeah yeah Mo extrude with the shader effect or a field and 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 get the object and everything too and it, it'd be you'd be on the road to getting there really quick but you'd have like five different menus to jump around through to control the different noises and uh, the UX of it would, would isn't as compact as this which I think is is very cool it's it's familiar and it made things like somehow even more maxony and and speedy like you're like your time to first image like which everyone loves in render world that's why we all swapped over to GPU land is like is so quick with the base level creation that you're going for it's very fun yep um somebody uh, chop in the chat is mentioning and i i totally agree that there's a difference between dragging one of these nodes from mm -hmm. into the scene manager and dragging it into the nodes directly and i'm not sure if this is just something that didn't get addressed yet or if this is an intentional decision but you see as i drag as i put this extrude in here that the extrude here is shown as a modeling operation and check out that we are feeding in the operation stream and outputting the operation stream. But if I grab an extrude and instead of dragging it into the scene manager, I drag it here into the nodes, you'll see that this is a completely different type. It is no longer a modeling operation. It's more like the raw geometry function now. And this now wants to be fed geometry and output geometry. So there's a difference between those two. And I mean, there's good reasons to do either. I would love the ability to um, like hold down a modifier key or something to like bring this in as an operation. So I'm trying right now because maybe I could do it and I just don't know. No, I, I just tried it and they, none of them are, but it'd be great to drag it in as a modeling op instead. The, um, I wonder if we can say, yeah, let's convert to assets, but we can't explode it as an asset. Yeah, I would love to know because, okay, if, yeah, just when we were going through this and you showed the, oh, it has to be an op linked to go to this, it totally destroys the scene manager. Yeah, like it becomes an it, there. There must be a node that we're missing in the process that allows it to interject itself into the scene manager correctly. Yes, agreed. Let me see if I just want to see this as a uh, dual mesh two. There's a sequel. That this is something I made. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and I want to see. Yeah, okay. So I was able to make. I made a modeling operation, and now you see it is able to. I didn't give an icon, but it is able to get put into the scene manager as a modeling operation. So our one of the goals today is to make one of these. And essentially, I went and I took the dual mesh concept and I was trying to, and you see I promoted a bunch of different settings in here where I can, um, well, I don't even remember. There's a lot of different controls in here and I don't know that it's all properly set up. And some of these are really gonna slow it down. Excuse yeah, me. It's not, uh, it's not doing everything I want to, but yeah, we're going to try and make something along those lines. And let's see, modifier, dual mesh. I don't know, can we go inside of it? I think you can. Can't you just? Yeah, edit assets. So here's yeah. the dual mesh. Well, here's the thing is if we drag an extrude in, actually, no, well, that's a dual mesh modifier. If we drag this extrude in here's an extrude and you'll see if i go to assets there is no edit asset if i drag the right. extrude in like this and i say asset there is no edit asset but this is something that was packaged up as if a user could package it up so if i select that there is an edit asset and going inside of there we can now see everything that made that up um, which you know it can be intimidating visually but we could start building something like this and have a significant simplification and where is, or maybe it's inside of it. Yeah, th this is where I'm going to get a little bit lost though. So we'll see what we can do. Uh, do we want to start moving that direction now? Or is there something else to interject before we move on to something like that and possibly hit a hard, hard dead end? Um, no, I think we can go over to that. Uh, Maurice is asking if there's some sort of time node. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's gotta be. Yeah, there's a time node right there. So this is just, uh, it's outputting the scene time, the system time, the FPS, the current frame. Yeah. So you could use this to drive anything. And let's just plug it in, why not? So here's the parameters of this single extrude. 
And if I were to take the frame and put it into, uh, let's see, I think I can just drag this in. And now here's the additional parameters. So there's inset, I think parameter offset is the one. So let's try hitting play and there we go. There's time driving that parameter. So yeah, just like Expresso. And you can do that on the even on the selection as well. Like if you use like the selection uh, that and had the like I had it before where you were adding on to the selection, you can have frame time increase into that. Yeah, I think I don't know that the undos are all working 100% because I don't think I'm gonna be. Oh, I was able to get back this time. So yeah, let's hit uh, C. There's the time node still searched for. We've got the oh, random selection. Rick showed up. Hello, Rick. Yeah, let's see what we plug this timeline in there. Um, I don't know if you he overheard what we were just asking about, Rick, but we noticed there's uh, there's not parity in extrude as it drag it, drug into the node graph and the extrude drug into the scene manager. Like one of them is a modeling operator and the other one is one that you have to sort of create into a modeling operator. And um, we're unsure of how you go about Go, uh, bleh, go along making your own version of that. Yeah, the, well, essentially, how would we go about taking this extrude, which is dragged directly over, how would we put it in the modeling operation wrapper? Now, I don't know for sure, but if we do go to asset construction, see, I don't think it's the geometry operator. And I mean, I think I have gone over this with Rick before as well, but I just don't know what the uh, direct setting is. We need to add that convenience insertion in node graph. Yeah, and there's a mm. lot of things that are in progress. Yeah. So, um, maybe, yeah, see, so convert to asset, but it's an operator group. That's a modeling op. How do we make a, I, I mean, is a geometry operation get defined as a modeling operation? I don't know. The, you have um, to create a modeling op node instead. Like, you, you can't, he said. You can't directly. Oh yeah, well that's fine. Okay, so we can't we can't put it in this wrapper. But like I said, I did make that dual mesh, which is um, I was able to make this, and now it is it doesn't have a icon. But you'll see that I could actually grab this extrude. And I'm like, oh no, it's actually my dual mesh too. So you see, my thing I created does appear in the list, and I'm pretty sure if I even took that dual mesh, I probably could. Can I move it into? Uh, yeah, I could actually move it into the geometry modifier. So now it lives with the rest of these. And presumably, if we opened up the detail panel, it looks like that. But uh, I'm just going to, it's not going to be correct. But I think, oh, we have to send it to the, can you, I'm going to take a screenshot. Can you take a screenshot and paste it into a uh, uh, Windows Shift S? Can you paste into the viewport? Or maybe, I'm not sure, right click. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, update preview from clipboard. So I just right, I took a screenshot and I just right clicked and pasted and now that has become my icon. So pretty straightforward to be able to do that. Pretty cool addition as well. Yeah. Yeah, I like the, the whole new asset manager thing was quite a surprise. It was one of those things that I, like a lot of people probably saw and were like, huh, I don't know, but it's gonna quickly take over like a lot of people's workflows. <laughs> yeah. The um Let's see. Well, yeah, um, as I said, I would love to try and make this as a wrapper. Let me open, let me check a file real quick if you want to talk for a second as I just hunt my scene files. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, what do I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I, I'm, uh, for, I, I'm, I'm super excited about this release cadence that's been going on and the way that the S's have been going into the R's. I know some people, and I know that's a super hot take, like the name change doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and uh, I'm actually pretty stoked that there's sort of like this advanced state of development occurring, even if it's only perceived advanced. Um, and there's like features in this window and features in this window. And uh, I like that twice a year I can kind of count on um, getting some new toys to play with. I, it's, it's very cool. Because I, I mean, re remember when there was a time where for a year, all we really got were new bevels. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. There, there were there were lighter releases and fancier ones. Um, oh, and um, switch to the, the nodes tab. Well, I thought it was supposed should... to be in operators. What's the uh, difference? 
Nodes tab. Switch the node tab of the asset browser for starters. I mean, I guess we get additional little things like uh, data structures and whatnot. So it depends on what you're looking for, but it's slightly more cluttered. But I thought this mostly showed more material nodes, so it was just slightly cleaner to click on operators. But good to mm. we'll keep we'll keep that in mind. So Rick, you want to chime in and maybe let us know when the uh, the iPad version of Cinema 4D is coming out? Now that it's on, now that it has a M1 chip inside of it, you know, I mean, it did uh, the press release for Redshift did say ship on M1. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not finding the very specific file, but let's just see if we can figure it out as we go. So um, let's just create some sort of modifier and then try and wrap it up. I think it's a really good way of kind of doing the hybrid of this type of uh, type of object. So let's say we're feeding it in some fairly low poly geometry here. It doesn't have to be this cube. In fact, I think the cube can, in the same way that everything can change the type, we change this to be anything we want. Let's make it a sphere and go in icosahedron. Decrease the poly count. So yeah, so it's a sphere and we want to modify it somehow. So in this case, modify it via, well, the first thing I like to do is select everything. So let's do a selection, random, random selection. And- Oh, it'd, it'd be kind of neat to try to figure out how that proximity based def deformation was occurring in that one sample file, I don't, or that's a little too out there even just that's, like a circle a sur like a sphere dimpling a sphere that is near right like a um, like a proximal type thing potentially fairly advanced um yeah. but okay. well let's do that as the next thing okay um, for okay. now let's just let's just stay in the stack right now so i am stay currently randomly selecting 50 percent of the points let's say i actually want to do 50 percent of the polygons and those 50 percent of polygons can get hmm actually why don't we delete them can we do a delete yeah so i'll delete those so half the polygons have gotten deleted and now that they're half deleted i could say i want to select everything so i'll copy my random selection to do 100 percent selection and from here perhaps do a yeah i'll do an inset so I do this inset and now this inner part is the part that's selected so if I were to hit delete, you'll see we get this outline. Actually, that's kind of cool. I was going to invert it, but let's leave it like that. So now that's happened. And then we will, now currently we deleted the entire selection. So nothing is selected, but it's important right now, at least to remember that in cinema, even in older cinema, if, if you do an effect and everything selected, it applies to everything. But if nothing is selected, it also applies to everything. It's only when things are partially selected that it only happens on, on that selection. So with nothing selected, I could just say, hey, I want a solidify. And I really like this as a modifier because it's essentially an extrude, but it caps it, which is just something that we could have been using for a long time. So we'll really just do a small- Really helps for 3D printing. Yeah, that's true. It's just, a, it's just a really nice volume. I mean, well, for how many years have we all been using the cloth nerbs as a way of putting procedural thickness on things? But now oh, there's an actual forever. solidify, yeah. <laughs> um, so now you see just with a couple of different modifiers, we now have this entire setup. So let's say that becomes something I want to package up as a, as a something that executes by itself. This is where, well, let's see. Um, I'm probably gonna do it wrong. I'm waiting for Rick to yell at us, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to right click and we could say group nodes, but I don't think we want to group. And, and we could say asset, convert to asset. But first we group something, but I'm pretty sure it needs to be fed. I thought it had to be fed into an asset construction. But maybe not, I don't know. I'm gonna try grouping it. So I'll just group those nodes. So everything, those have now collapsed down into, well, let me even show for some clarity. You see right now we're outputting the stream and this is all the information. This is the matrix, the geometry, like the, where the parent is and any children it has, that's all the information. And that would also include if we applied a material and that's all flowing through all of these. So by grouping it together, they are now being input that same thing and output that same thing. And now if we go inside of it, you can see that these are just being fed right through and doing the output. So what could be very complex in the viewport, we could make tons of nodes and just group them all and they collapse down into a single node. Um, so yeah, so that makes an operator group. But what I'd love to do is convert that to some sort of asset. So let's just call this um, random 
We didn't triangulate, so I guess it's just... I'll just call it random holes for now. So that is random holes, but I would love to try and convert that to an asset. But what does it do if I do that? So that's going to save it. And that goes into uncategorized, so there's random holes. But this isn't... Actually, maybe we did group it up. Look, as soon as I grouped it up, Casey, it actually did feed through because I think it's part of the operator lineup. If I, but if I select it, you see there are no properties. I'm not able to change it to different types. Oh, yeah. How do you promote those? If you want to be a modeling op, you need to be need a geometry modifier group. Okay, we yeah, had geometry modifier group. That's what I was kind of going for. So that becomes a geometry. So I'm going to undo. So that that's, you saw I was able to collapse that and actually became mm -hmm. a group because it was feeding in an operation, outputting an operation. So I think it fed through. So uh, Rick is saying that I want a geometry modifier group, which I don't know for sure, but I think that just means we can create a geometry operation. I mean, does it is it just that being output that does it? That seems unlikely. For science. Does that still feed through? Whoa, I mean, it did it. it. Well, it, it, oh, yeah, so there's a geometry operator. But if I group these together, it's still just an operator no, group. No, it's just an op. I don't think... Um, Where's the geometry modifier group? Yeah, where is the geometry modifier group? That is the question. I don't... We have a object group, but that's not geometry. We have an operator group. Does that have different modes? Doesn't look like it. I, I've just completely lost where that lives. Look at the third node in the asset browser. Geometry modifier. It's right there in front of us. Oh, geez. I, I always, because it's, it, I always look for it with one of these icons because to yeah. me, the, uh, the little equation one is the one. I know I'm just blind to that. Thanks, Rick. So let's zoom. I'm going to hit undo. Okay, so we're back here. We don't need that. So we actually, you know, so we're back to where we were. It's all just filtering through. So now there's a geometry modifier group. And this wants geometry in, geometry out. So if I were to copy all these nodes, copy them, and go inside this geometry modifier group and paste them, then now it wants geometry in, so we'll do that. This will not accept geometry, so let's make a geometry operation. And now we can actually f get fed geometry, and that will output an entire operation. And that is now properly fed in. And it wants to output geometry. And if we twirl down all of our information, so solidify, this does indeed have a geometry. So via that geometry. I will output just that. So now we have a geometry modifier group that's just modifying geometry. So if I were to delete everything we just made and select this, and let's call that, uh, first of all, let me delete this one and select this, and we'll call this one like random holes. Cool. So now with that selected, I will say asset, convert to asset, random holes, yes. Now it's uncategorized, but now there's random holes here. But where things get interesting is if I were to drag this and apply it, and if I did this right, you can now see it's an operator. And this operator will now, you see it's now hanging out with all of its kind of modeling operator brethren. It did not um, work though. That's true, it did not work. It's looking Unusual. It's not it's not working while it's packaged. Yeah, and, and the same thing happened on my dual modifier um, or my dual mesh too. So let's see. Let's grab that and convert it to an asset. So now you see I actually convert it back to this mode. And actually, you see it popped back to looking correct as soon as we did it. So, yeah, I feel like we're missing something there. What did we do? Well, we partially got it working, but... Oh, yeah, and this, didn't, this is now no longer a... Um, Oh, super weird. Inside here is a... It did turn into a modeling operation. With that selected, can I... I don't want to convert. I want it to be... Looks like that's kind of locked away. How do I explode it into just its original components? Because that did turn into a modeling op because we dragged it in there. If I were to drag it in, you see it looks like this. Can we edit? Yeah, okay, now I've gone inside of it. But what am I missing to make that actually output properly? Rick says, technically, you want to use the non-op slash geometry in-out versions of the modeling nodes inside the modifier. Oh, yeah, well, 
uh, would that be what's breaking it? The, um, I mean, it's fine. This is a pretty simple setup, so we can attempt to do it. And I'd love to promote some of these parameters so that you know people can kind of see the whole workflow. But remember, we were talking about how they're very different if you drag it in here or if you drag it in there. So if we were to do this again, so we start out with a selection. So let's go oh, our so we can't random start. selection. Mm. Yeah, and then we do our delete. Technical preview, people. We're, we're, get, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. We're learning things. And this then is... another random selection. And then the Eventually, selection. these have to be unified, though. I mean, I, I assume right now we're just like, we're at the, we're at some sort of like intersection of art and technology where the two have sh sh not met. <laughs> yeah, and that's weird, too. The solidify is acting as if it's a uh, an image. So, yeah, there's all sorts of weird little twitchy things, but... Let's take in the geometry, and then that will do a random selection. That random selection needs to be point-based, or polygon-based, in fact, both of these two. That will select all. This will delete all the current selection. It'll then randomly, it'll select everything with them all selected. It'll do an inset. That inset will then get, is that, oh, I dragged the wrong type of delete in. Delete. That will then delete that active geometry, and then all the remaining geometry will automatically be solidified, thus outputting it. Delete that. So now we should be able to close. Do we have to save? Yeah, save. Save new version? Yeah, save new version. So now it's 1.1. 1 .1. So oh, we're making progress. This development cycle is making huge progress. Like The investors are going to be so stoked to know that we're already at 1.1. 1 .1. <laughs> um okay so now there should be a new version of random holes so if we go to uncategorized let's see if this is now acknowledging yeah that's 1.1 1. 1. 1 now so let's delete that random holes and drag in version two hey there we hey go. so there we have now successfully made a well we've now made a modeling op by creating a um by creating this asset and then now it will appear in the list of that type of input if i select it you can now see that it's all the different types so now as a next step what if we try and just put a couple of controls on there and then we can move on to something maybe do some of that deformation you were talking about um but uh, i should go and uh i haven't been taking uh, can you keep an extra eye on the chat it's hard to create nodes and read the chat um what sorcery is this? Explode it. Um, <laughs> no recall. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's set some settings up in here. So I should be able to edit the asset again. So now we're back inside. And we've got some, here's, well, here's the most obvious thing is we've got our initial random selection, which is set to 50%. But if I, let's see, how do we do this? I want to, Yeah, here's the inputs. I'm gonna say here is chance. So now you see that's actually a node here. And the easiest way of doing this is just dragging this parameter and dragging it to this big old input. And then it'll say propagate port. And now chance has been output. Uh, while we're at it, how about we change the amount of solidify we can get. So right clicking. Um, this one's being a little weird. Yeah, that one is being weird. Can we drag a port? No, we can't. Yeah, the solidify, the fact that this image is here, I think this entire thing is not packaged up completely correctly. But, well, I don't want to make one from scratch. That's dangerous. Because you can just make new inputs. But here's definitely some place that cinema, or where, where some, simpli some simplification can be added. Because if we say edit port, we end up in this interface, which is a lot of overwhelming information. Like we've got all these different tabs of information and especially where it's things like here's general, but string is actually the name of it. So this would be thickness. And then under, let's see. Yeah, done under data type, I could say it's a float. And then here's the unit. I want it to be meters. The value, we could put limiting values on there. Let's not worry about that. And UI, I'm not sure. Okay, those are different UI elements. I don't even know if this will work, but let's just say we've done a simpler version of that. So hopefully that is thickness that we can then drag in here. Maybe 
because there's only one parameter that input is that amount because you see the input just disappeared so yeah maybe that it's still there's still a bug in that but so now we've got those two controls in theory so let's save that as a new version and selecting that yeah now look now we have two inputs and if i select that there are now two controls so that's been saved as a new version i wonder if we can update this so this is I don't random see holes oh there, random go? holes yeah so did that jump it up to the late yeah asset version latest so it's always presumably going to the updated Ooh. version you can roll back oh yeah yeah you can always you can uh pretty sure at any point you can go to versions yeah i can select any one of these and go to the older version oh but it wasn't on the in the asset version drop down it doesn't look like it's in the drop down i'm not that sure. would be amazing if, yeah oh it, hopefully that does happen because because that like from like from a uh, from a tool maker aspect uh, from like a technical director role working on a team with people like if you push out an update like that in the asset browser and you're like oh, okay Check out, you know, Chris Random Holes uh, one three. That has the feature you'll need for that. Um, don't upgrade all shots to one three though. Keep on one two. It's, uh, it's working. That one three pitch is just for Casey's weird technical difficulty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now you can see that we have actually created a full on proper asset now, where I have put in some custom controls, and we can select the. You know, I can randomize these this way. We can change the thickness, and. Yeah, you know, it's a full blown asset. It's got the let's uh you know, I'm not gonna put any materials in here, but let's take a screenshot of that. Right click on the image and paste it from clipboard, so at least it's got a thumbnail. I can drag this into the modifiers and now I've got the random hole generator, meaning we can start a completely brand new scene. I should be able to drag this into the stack. It's now getting modified, it plugged in, it's a modeling op. So we've kind of done from scratch, made an asset that can live just like any other yeah so. oh man it's so fun <laughs> it's it like and, and now also like if that was running really crazy fast like make that make that sphere super chunky like just to show that like you'll be able to scrub that bar like even if you give it oh no, no i mean like give it like hundreds of segments and I then don't, well i don't know that model modeling operations are that fast but let's uh check it up so and then Yeah, it's not the, I mean, I'm getting not the craziest frame rate. But that, I mean, it's pretty it's more, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and set the thickness. So yeah, you can see, and then we could at any given point go and modify, add extra settings in, go back into the original. The, um, I guess here's just kind of a question of mine. If I drag the random holes back in, yeah, I'm back there. So if I say... I would like to edit the asset. Yeah, it still goes inside and I could save a new version of it. So it's as simple as that. It, we wouldn't even need to save this as a separate file. I kept on saying that uh, I was trying to find my dual mesh, but I could have at any point dragged in this dual mesh. You see, I did add in a lots of settings and we could have just said edit asset and go inside and see all the different notes I put in there. But we'll probably see that I have, yeah, I have some modeling ops in here, which is why mine wasn't working. We needed to oh. not do the operators. We needed to do it from the raw inputs. Because I, I guess it probably becomes like this inception thing where it's like you're feeding in an oper. It's an it's got modeling operations inside of it, but it itself isn't a modeling operator. I don't know if that's the limitation, but, but we've now yeah, I don't know. successfully from scratch. And it's got its own icon and everything. So What happens if you random holes, random holes? Oh, uh, well, let's be careful. Um, be, well, let's give it. Let's give it. I'm going to first of all simplify the geometry just a little bit because I, I just don't think we'll be able to see it. I think it could handle it, but we just won't be able to see it. So let's yeah. really reduce this, and then take the current random holes and we'll add a significant amount of thickness so there's actually something to see. Although I think that these caps will look a little bit weird. But yeah, now let's, let's just uh, let's just add in a second random hole. Yeah, so it's going to. It's going to be randomly oh. deselecting some of them, and also this is yeah. I, I would I would expect this type of thing to happen. If you subdivided it first, it probably would be a little better. Uh could be, and we can of course just interject that in here. Yeah, see that this is, and this is where I, it would kind of be like why the version numbers would go up because you'd be like, oh cool, can you just do a version where I have a subdivision control at the end of the stack or before and the front of the stack? Yeah, like exactly. Front sub, post sub. 
Yep. And yeah, you just keep on modifying and adding and changes. So yeah, building little local tools for a like given studio or a project you're working on, that's uh, that's going to be huge. And that thing's actually cool. Like that's actually some like decent like space junk greeble. Like like I could see myself like making stuff like that. Like just be like ah, I just need something that's kind of just like chonky and like wraps around the spline and is like a background thing. And then you know my big thing is usually I'll delete all the polys and leave only the points. And then, you know, shrink that width on like a spline wrap or something. Yeah. And then boom, you have all kinds of just like abstractly grid pointed dots that you can render different colors and have them travel through your scene as like a data stream. Uh, th that, that is, this has been my Rocket Lasso, how to make data viz free premium tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think one of the main problems for these exploding things is we're just doing these uh, we're doing insets on very tiny bits of geometry. So as a as a you know just as a one step to possibly solve that is if I say edit asset, let's go and promote that one setting, which is. And uh, how do I? I, I hope wish... that there's a script. To, uh, is there is there a Python node or any form of scripting node that can like take a value and clamp it based on uh, like a threshold. Like, cause obviously here, like programmatically, you, you, could, you, could, you could script out like those jaggies never happening. Like if you saw that happening and you're writing a plugin for this, you'd just go through and be like, oh, well, if the distance between nearest neighbor is blank, then never go past X. Um, yeah, potentially. It depends on what you're doing. It's it, you really want to cut it off at the root and not after the problem has happened. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do right now would be the idea. Although this this inset is not allowing me to promote its. Uh, well, here's here's definitely a feature request I want. I want the ability to grab the name and drag the node in there like Expresso. Like that would that would be huge. But right now, if I right click, oh I, oh, it's add input. I kept on expecting to see a list, but okay, add input. And I want the inset. So that's a percentage inset. And then that can get promoted. So that inset promotion, asset, save new version. And then can I select these? And yep, yeah, oh. something went something went a little crazy on those. Yeah, there's definitely that could use a little bit of love, but super simple to delete those and add in. Oh, it looks like a new version also killed the uh, thumbnail, so that's a that's a thing. Boop. So there's another. Well, that's. Thumbnail. I mean, that's pretty handy too because you could like, you know, some packages release early versions of software with different colored icons. <laughs> yeah. So so if you have like a version that you push to your team and they see that in the asset in the asset browser that there's a red version, it's like, oh, okay. Uh, Chris is working promoted, Chris is working on that. I promoted the wrong type of inset. This is the uh oh, set there was two instead of the percentage. Yeah, there was two. But they were in the opposite order in the uh list. So I was assuming they would be the same. But yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we're, we can go down that rabbit hole as much as we want to to keep on creating and modifying minor assets, but the, um, but yeah, that's a little bit of that workflow to kind of go full circle and bring it back into the the asset browser. So moving on. Well, yeah, this yeah. stuff can start getting real specific because something Casey is particularly interested in is deforming geometry. Um, and there's several different ways of potentially thinking about that. But let's... Um, I always start with a plane. Like a plane is just a really good way of keeping everything as simple as possible. So yeah. before going to a sphere, I'll start on a plane. So with a plane, man, there's going to be a couple UVs things. Too. What's that? Oh, Better yeah. UVs too. You don't have to worry about the weird balloon ends. So let's see. We're going to make this real at all. I have to search for geo and get a geometry operation. So we're taking raw geometry. And that can now be output as a child. And now we actually see it in the viewport. Now, this is the way <clears throat> the way I'm building this. It's not going to appear in the scene manager because I'm just not wrapping it up in the way that it would. But yeah, this gets challenging. Well, let's, we have to go step by step. So let's just say we want to build from scratch mathematically some sort of deformation. So let's search for... I don't even, I, well, let's hit, 
what's the best way to look for it? Because we can search for the word point, and then we get things like uh, geom geometry property get. There's point info. I think we might need that. We might need point set. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. This this is correct. Yeah. This is all. This is what we need. This point info and point set because this point info we can feed raw geometry, and now it's been fed geometry. It'll give us point normals and point positions. There's actually yeah. Uh, there's just a setting for normals. Everything else is just what it is. Um, okay. Rick uh, says, yeah, thanks Rick. Yeah. Hot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Use a primitive op instead of geometry. Let's try that. So geometry generator and here's the primitive. And yeah, you see that's now an op and because it's an op that will actually output. So now we can interrupt. Oh, now we need to change this to a plane change that to a plane and now we could steal its geometry out and now we're doing the same thing so we are able to skip this geometry operation part although we might need to bring it back in again but in any case now you see that we're actually taking the actual geometry and we're getting things like point positions so we want to modify those point positions somehow now what it, i think we a point position so that's the actual position is there a way of getting the index? Let's search for the word geometry and geometry property. Maybe. Yeah, so what is this outputting? Oh yeah, so we can also get the 3D points. So by feeding this the geometry, we're getting additional information. So we can get the 3D That'll points, the color, array, right? the UVs. So that gives us tons of different things. And an array, and that's a list of all of the points as well. So this point has a, a list. So now let's search for the word index. And we can get the element, or we can do an index iterator, which is probably what we need. So this is now being fed a list of points. And actually, here's something to show is this is going to be outputting a whole bunch of things. Um, until we feed it into the rest of the scene, though, it won't refresh, I don't think. Uh, I, I want to do a port, a port a data inspector. So down here, I want to see this data inspector. But you see it's null data right now. It's going to be null data until this is flowing through somehow. So um, this is not a correct anything, but it is a way to actually output it. And now, now that's actually, f until the stream connects all the way to the output, it, it doesn't calculate it. That's like a good optimization. But now that I've forced it to output, you can actually see that this new data inspector is giving us a list of values. So these are all the values that are being output. So this is index zero, and inside of it is a point. And that point has the value of negative 50, zero, 50. So we could actually do things. We could do things with that. So, um... I, we could use the hash is a good way of randomizing things. So we could take. I still the, haven't. Uh, I still haven't completely wrapped my head around the hash. I haven't completely wrapped my mind around it, but a good way of thinking of it is kind of like a range mapper, but for generating random values. You're, you're saying, hey, map this value onto this type of value. And that's a simple way of thinking of it. So okay. uh, typically I pump the the input like the index is going to be unique on every point i pump that through the salt uh because then i could i have the option of how do i get back to my parameters there uh, i have the option of changing the seed at any given point now we're not seeing anything we have to do a little bit of math before we see something but we can start outputting integers from that or floats or vector threes but here's my thought is here's an array there's the index i would like to get the element so let's search for get and here's get element. So we need to feed it an array. And then I'm gonna say, okay, there's that's the array. It's a list of points. I want to look at a specific point and this is going to go point zero and then do point one and then do point two. So this is now outputting the value. It's outputting the value of this vector. So we need to split that vector somehow. So let's search for the word vector. And I'm going to say, how do we explode a vector? Split you just split it into three? Split. Yeah, so here's a split vector. So now we have an X, a Y, and a Z. I would like to randomize the Y. So this, in theory, could be outputting randomized numbers. And here's the max and min. So let's say it's got a maximum of 100. So it's outputting anywhere from 0 to 100 randomly based on the index. So now let's build a vector. So let's say compose a vector, 3D. I say I want the same X. I want the same Z. 
but I want a new Y. And this new Y is going to be whatever this randomizing is outputting. So this is now going to output the... Do you not want the float? Uh, it could be a float. Yeah. Now, Just now, for, now, an, for, for animated properties. Yeah. Like you... yeah. So now it's instead of being whole numbers, it can be fraction, you know, fraction numbers and decimals. So now we have a vector, but this vector needs to be overriding the array, that same element in the array. So we don't want to append an element. How do we replace an element? Oh, what was that? No. Set element. Aha. Okay. So here's set element. And so now we say, okay, I want that same original array. So here's the original list of zero all the way through every point. But I'm going to say, hey, when you get to this index, you are not the value you used to be. You are now this new value. So that is rebuilding a brand new array. So we're now outputting an array of points. So here's our point set. I'm going to say that here is your new locations. And then we need to take the original geometry. So essentially we're saying, hey, all the polygons that we got, those are still the same. But then the points are getting changed and that this point set is being fed into a geometry operation and that is getting output into the scene. And now you can see through all that work, we have now created a random on Y displacer. I'm gonna say shift L to kind of let this automatically clean up the, uh, the arrangement of them. And this point info is a orphan now, so we don't need that. And yeah, so that's a randomizer there. If we go back to the hash, we should be able to pull this minimum down. As I pull it down, you see that the strength of this is weakening. And you can see how we've deformed this in this way. And that that how that has now allowed us to create a very simple geometry deformer. Um, but that was us using this hash to randomly generate it. So you were kind of talking about, well, let's do a more controlled um, deformation. So how about saying it should deform upward depending on how far it is from a particular point in space. So we are already getting the index and that's giving us an element and that is actually a point in space. So let's search for a distance. So here's a distance calculation and it just wants to know how far it is from something. So this is a one of the locations, but where is the other location? Well, we could just leave it at zero, 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 but we could also pipe something into that. So we'll just leave it zero, zero for now. So now we're saying this will give us a distance calculation and we'll probably, I'm immediately gonna just search for a multiply. So here is a arithmetic multiply. I should be able to drag that directly in the node, but I just didn't. Um, okay, so now we have a multiply. I'm gonna say just one to start out with. But I think if we just say, okay, that's your new Y, then yeah, you now yep. see that based on the distance, yeah, based on distance, we have now, yeah, it's kind of like a French fry holder. Like they wrapped up the French Ooh, fries. The, it's um, protein. So yeah, and now this multiplier is going to be how strong that is. But that's, um, if we were to range map that, we could start creating, is there just a range map? And if there is a range map, it doesn't have a spline. So we've got, Range mapper. Yeah, but there's no spline. I really want a spline. Is there a way of mapping something with a vector spline? Or like with a with a spline user data? Oh yeah. Yeah, there should. Probably a yeah, you probably use a field. Can 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 you use a field oh, and convert geez. the I data? every time I try to use a field I hit a, a dead end. I'm not saying it can't be done. I just I personally don't Yeah, I have it. I've been trying to use fields for things too, and I'm like, uh, it just doesn't quite do it. But that's kind of one of those things where, like, a lot of this is is modeling. Yes, and Sp it's also my spline favorite. mapper. Spline mapper. That's what Rick says. Spline. Oh, okay. Heck spline. yes. Okay, range mapper and spline mapper are two different things now, but this is what we wanted. So it's a spline mapper. <laughs> um, it does. I in it's like in my zero. in my head, I just want it to just be called mapper. And then have a whole bunch of drop downs oh, yeah. that let you toggle it. <laughs> so, um, I want to put this in before we do the multiply. And this is currently min max. So, uh, how does this work? Min max. Um, 
Yeah, I'm a little stumped because what what values do we want this to say? I'm gonna say, oh, that's the position of it. Tension. Yeah, those are just spline parameters. But where's the? That's a distance. So this is just a this is just a float getting output. Yeah, spline mapper. Hmm. Uh, no, Bobby, you're here, and it's a live show. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm not understanding this. That's the position, and then we are mapping it. So is this mapping one zero to one zero to one? Is it supposed to be zero to zero? Yeah, that just changes the way these points are laid out. These are just the numerical representations of these points, it seems. No, it's not. But yeah, I, this is not outputting anything. Like, I feel like we should be seeing the same shape until we modify it. Wait, something did change right there in the center. Oh. It's just really tiny. Maybe the max needed to be way bigger. But how... Oh man, this is different. Details, yeah, so those are just the points, but I, I actually increased the max. This is not a parameter we used to have, but look, I was actually able to make the range mapper go beyond one, so that's kind of a new oh, concept. Oh no. <laughs> the, uh, but I don't know. Oh, it's doing something. I know it's, doing something let's multiply it by 10 there okay, we go it's sort of doing a thing now we're oh, man, creating a black hole to... but the distance must be huge that doesn't i don't think that's doing anything when you make what? the max that big well as I, it does once i move this to go meet it but that's the part that's oh yeah off i mean really should probably be mapping this from zero to one the distance oh, on, so that you can just you can on position x down in, in the the manager you can just type you can just change it see where it says 33.565 if you move down on the mouse just yeah. change that to change that to the number you want it to be 100 yeah. percent. and it'll, it'll move the point there for you yeah and we just need some sort of maximum distance um but yeah we should probably be working on this well i guess 100 no, 100 is literally 100 but we're now not that large but yeah I, the, the point being it's a little, this is not, well, it's not instantly intuitive to me. And no. now I'm not able to, yeah, I, this window doesn't seem stretchable. So you have to like zoom around inside it. But anyway, the point being is I should be able to, yeah, remap things like this. And we should be able to get there. Now we're finally getting the kind of hill that I was originally looking for. Um, we could probably do this in a much cleaner way. But yeah, now we have a fall off and that's based on, the distance to this position, but I could move this position anywhere. So, and keep in mind, we just did the math to make this happen. So this isn't really cinema giving us anything for free. This is, it's almost like we just built a proximal, but for geometry and yes. we're saying, oh, deform upward. Yep. And so, we built it with the ability to do anything along the chain that we want to do to it. It's not like, it's not a, uh, you know, quote unquote black box. Like right. you could, you're completely open ended to do whatever you want in this. Yeah, we could mix in some of the hash values. We could, uh, yeah, some sort of mix or blend of those. I wonder, can we, could I create a null, a regular cinema null in the object manager? And then could we bring this in and can I get its position? So there's a local matrix that is going to be a matrix. So let's search for the word matrix and decompose the matrix. So the matrix is the combination of position scale and rotation. Of course, here it's called translation. So let's grab the translation, which is position and say that's the position. So now, yes, look, I've now linked it to a null. So I now have control over this in the viewport. Now, I don't know how to make that be on multiple objects, but I am considering this was completely unplanned and we didn't know where we were going. I'm I'm happy I was able to make this happen. But there's, yeah, how, there's a lot of details. How do you link it to multiple objects? Well, see, that's where I'm confused because 
that's like yeah i'm feeding it in once but this distance you can't feed in a vector i'm sorry you can't feed in an array of vectors like an mm. array of positions i don't think so you well i mean let's let's see that should be simple enough let's make an array and there's append elements potentially fill array so i think this is just an array and currently let's set it to a data type of being a vector and feed an array into the distances oh well rick I was saying, rick it seems like rick is saying what i'm attempting to do is going to work but we'll find out so we shall find um, out this is the value oh maybe fill array isn't what i want how do i create an array from scratch sort truncate He says use build. build instead. Okay, yeah. So here we should be able to set this to a vector. And now we've got four elements. I just want two. So we'll just delete two of those, add one. So this can be negative 50. And this one will be positive 50. And everything else is zeroed out. So that should just be an array of two elements. And let's feed that in. Uh, see, yeah, I only did one of them. He yelled build. Data type, maybe, is what he means? This is build. It's a vector. It's a build vector. This oh, distance I, I is also a vector. Yeah, that should... Yeah, so... Do you need to give it... Well, and add, you have two elements. Yeah. Why is it... It doesn't see that one, one yeah. though? It's not... Yeah, it's only seeing one. So, like, to me, this is... This isn't seeing the array... It's only seeing a single value. Um, now, that, that doesn't mean that there's not a different way of building these because this distance is kind of outside of this iteration. No, it's not. It's, I mean, it's being fed the vector. But it's like we need to do it twice. I mean, yeah, and I wouldn't want to... something downstream is killing it don't use the index iterator if i don't use the index iterator i don't know how to make the rest of it work though if i delete that everything breaks yeah th th there's probably i'm going to say there's going to be a way to do it and we have to rebuild things in a slightly different way i don't know what that way is and i think to uh it, it's gonna be too tricky to do it step by step by step just feed um, the array from the geometry property get to the distance known. So from the geometry property get, you already have the array that's right there. Yeah. Just just saying, just feed that only. Yeah. So we might not have needed to get the direct one, and then we're multiplying and we're composing the vector, but that's still from that. But we should split the vector from there. Oop, didn't like that. Oh, we made a crazy line of some sort. That's weird. Spline generator coming soon. Oh, let's get the vector <laughs> from the original array. We're composing the vector, setting the element. Yeah, it's still just seeing the one. I mean, we were, we were just able to eliminate a couple nodes. So that's nice. We also have, oh, we still have this iterator. Let's get rid of that. Um, but yeah, now the set element doesn't work. So feed the feed your multiplier right into the point set. Oh, that makes sense, maybe. Oh, it's happening. It's, <laughs> uh, yes, I understand. Well. Well, yeah, but it's not a vector anymore. See, we're feeding in this and getting a distance. Oh, yeah, so we yeah. still have to compose. We still have to compose the it vector. says kill set element. Well, it's, it's out of the well, stream. It's not doing it's anything. anything. Yeah. Well, this that yeah, this is why I don't want to pursue. Once, once, once we start hitting a dead end, I don't want to spend too long on it because Rick. Uh... Mm, compose vector, not multiply. Okay, yeah. Oh, keep the compose vector? 
and the spline mapper see but even the spline that's distances but yeah this should be splitting the vector and then that should be composing it and then that results could go out no nope. because we still need to compose the vector from this array, so that splits it. We build the Y, because all we care about here is building the Y value, which gets multiplied by one. We compose the vector. Set element's not doing anything, but yeah, then we output this, and it would should work, but. So we're the, just, the geometry's gone. There's not even anything in the uh, data manager. Oh, you have, you have it small. Yeah, it's down here. But we're still outputting. Actually, yeah, let's see what this is outputting. So, uh, port inspector, not port inspector. Let's do a data inspector. And it's saying null, so that's currently outputting nothing. Um, well, let's go, let's backtrack and see where it breaks. So, here's a multiply. Let's see what that's doing. That's also a null data. That's fine. Data inspector. Yeah, all these are saying null. So mm, either I did something super wrong or we broke it. Yeah, it's it's busted. It's busted. It's fine. We can look into it at a different time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um oh yeah, we had we had some cool stuff going. I'm going to try to undo until I get the uh yeah, the somewhat Hey, there we go. Back. So, this is at least our Let's plug the null back in again, just so we can get that sort of version working. Yeah, so wherever this null goes, we get the bump. But yeah, well, I'll talk to Rick afterward, get more detail, and we can cover that again at some other point. Um, yeah, exactly. that's cool, because then you you know you have to have like an object falling or whatever, and it's like kind of warm. You can do like a little fake bouncy sheet. Yeah, and yeah, even this multiply, I should be able to yeah change the multiply. We get boing boing boing. We could feed a time through a sine wave that would make this oscillate back and forth. The um, So we have control position. We could range map it multiple times. We could feed this entire range map value through it. And uh, let's see what that would do. Sine, I, I don't know if this is a good idea, but if we feed. It's only one way to find out. Value through a sine wave. Yeah, so we can. Okay, that's actually instantly worked. So let's increase our subdivisions to. One 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 by one one one, and yeah, boom! Now it's able to ripple feed, solver. Yeah, we were able to feed <laughs> that through uh, for the sine wave. Wasn't there just a value there we could change? We, yeah. So we can create as many of those ripples as we want, and then you know that's a multiply. So search for time. Grab the time again and we'll feed the frame into the multiply and hit rewind hit play and now we get ripples automatically playing so i mean you know th that's where we're in the raw build option so you know as you were saying like we can interject at any point and modify things remap any value to any other value you can go back to the original value and remap it again and that's what's cool about these nodes is um, we're feeding it through the sine wave but what if we take Let's take the result of the sine wave and add it to the original multiply or even an alternative multiply. And that should push the entire thing up if we feed that into the Y value. So yeah, look, now we get like a birthday cake thing as this steps up. Um, so yeah, these will push upward as they go. So you know, we have access to all the math as we go and manipulating any given part of it yeah it's super crazy and this is this is you know with no keyframes so you're just building your own rigs to do whatever crazy stuff you want to do no keyframes the way animation was intended exactly who needs keyframes 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 are people that don't want to go home <laughs> <laughs> let's see let's see i didn't have any other specific rigs in mind let's see what i got here let me just pop oh. open. Oh, go I was going to say, pop open that beta file just to show 
just to show what we were, what was kind of like stem from the 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 sphere eater thing. If you want oh. to, I just thought it was so cool. It's from one of the Maxon tester folks or someone at Maxon, um, and it's it's just so neat. Yeah. So we were doing the first couple steps of something like this, but this is successfully getting multiple points, and they get their spheres moving around to generate it. But you'll see here when it comes to the actual nodes that it's like, okay, well, here's the scene. It doesn't seem too crazy there. I mean, ours was already like that complex. But if we zoom in, I bet you we've got some nodes within nodes here. Like, yeah, here's get the formed points, which is a group, and inside there is a small function built out. And I wouldn't be surprised if we run into some additional ones. Uh, yeah, more get deformed points. I'm not even sure what that does. Fit to range. Yeah, I've been picking apart little files useful. like this that I found. Just because there's not a lot of, like, the cool MoGraph stuff happening inside this yet. And, um, and it's really not even, like, that conducive to it at this point. Like, it's much more about, like, modeling and doing that stuff. Um, but... Whenever I see a sample file or someone's tip that has something like this in it, I'm like, oh, yes, it begins. Yeah. But the, well, here's the crazy part is because what ends up having to happen, and this is important to mention for anybody who's watching, is uh, I think the plan here is that Maxon doesn't expect everybody to learn C nodes, and at least not with any detail. Just imagine Espresso. With Espresso, there's probably quite a few people who know how to do set driver, set driven, but they don't know how to go into Espresso and make all sorts of crazy advanced rigs. When it comes to scene nodes, you shouldn't have to go into the scene nodes. The idea eventually will be that you can just do things like I was doing, like dragging the modifier stacks in or just treating it more like classic cinema. So what we're doing is we're going really deep into it and getting into the nitty gritty of the nodes. But it does come down to the... It does come down to you will need to know the nitty gritty. Like looking at this, if you asked me how to build this out of MoGraph, we could build a rig that does this no problem. But if you're like, oh, what's the math to make this happen? That's what we. That's when we start getting to this. And it does start getting to the point where we start having to understand building out arrays and the way a matrix works and like breaking apart the geometry, multiplying something, feeding it back into the geometry. There's a lot of knowing the raw elements and it can get intimidating right away and i think a lot of the animation here is probably being driven by time yeah here's time and you see that's feeding into a multiply which eventually goes into a cosine and that's creating some of this oscillating motion which probably means the entire thing loops so there's a there's a lot of of things like that that are going to go on here's a sphere primitive what happens if we change it to a cube yeah, so we still have these unrelated spheres moving oh, around. So those are individual spheres. And then the cube is just doing some sort of deformation. So as we start adding yeah, adding in a couple of subdivisions, you can see that that will also deform. But this is all being generated in here. But as you saw, as even we were going through and trying to build this file, it's really, really important to just go step by step and be like, okay, let's do a simple thing. Like, oh, we just, eventually we just, or the first thing we do is let's see if we can move, make the points move up and down. Oh, we did make points move up and down on the simplest object we could. Cool. Let's try and make it have a bump. Okay. We got a bump. Let's range map it. So kind of being very, very step by step. And then keep in mind that if we do get this working, well, you know, if we liked this entire layout, we could always grab all the nodes, group them, and then just call them like ripple offset or something. And that becomes its own standalone combination. Yeah. And well, ideally in down the line, what's happening is as you're building everything out in scene manager to make that sphere spinning around or objects spinning around with dimples and everything happening based on, you know, simple primitive objects that you can change out to be whatever it is here and there. Um, the nodes are happening in the back end too. So if you have like a technical director on the, on the job, who's, who, who's, you know, responsibility is for to make sure that the scenes don't get out of hand to where, you know, they don't render or they're too crashy or something, they could pop into the node side of things and be like, oh, I can simplify this really quick. Clean up a couple of things and push it back out. Yep. Yeah, I wonder, I was just trying to look in this and see if I could see what we did wrong in the other one, because there's similar things happening. They are doing a point set. There's this, the range map. It's amazing how many of the same nodes end up here. Like there's the distance calculation, very similar to what we were doing, getting from the points. 
Yeah, and that's one of those things where it's like, okay, well, this is happening so often, I absolutely could see these three nodes just being coupled as one node down the road with their own little, like, index, like, you know, sets or whatever. Or I just do that because I'm tired of going distance, min, fit, spline. <laughs> yeah, well, as an example, the, the furthest I've gone, and it was just for playing, and people have probably seen a bunch of this, but in my S24 demos, I had made this city... So here's a, this is the furthest I went. And what this is doing is taking in raw geometry. Let me uh, break. God, I love the viewport. That. One yeah. of the so best here, things here, about cinema. <laughs> so here's the actual, this is what I'm inputting. You see, I'm taking a end side and a loft, and that goes in as the raw geometry. And then ba and even just so you can see it, I'll drop this down to five sides. And I'll feed this in. And through all of the nodes that I'm I'm feeding through this entire situation. Let's see. Either it's super calculating or I plugged the wrong thing in somewhere. Was I supposed to grab one of the outputs? I don't know. But it seems to have frozen up. Whoops. I literally just broke a node and I reconnected it and I think I connected the wrong thing. It might wake <laughs> up, but it might be. My, uh, my keyframes are for people that don't want to go home. <laughs> people are someone tweeted it now it's being retweeted a bunch <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i seem to have killed it unfortunately oh no uh, i mean that's not a big deal i can easily force quit but now i can't save that uh little node thing we had made Boom. oh no dead and open again uh, Alan, the PSR button is not gone. It just has a new icon and a new name. Although I, for years, have been doing tutorials saying hit Shift C PSR, and now it's not called PSR anymore, so it's really hard to search for. It is this button. No, it's not that button. It's this button right here. It's called Reset Transform now, but it's really hard. If you search for Reset, the word Preset is there a million times. So Reset Transform. Yeah, you have to type in Reset Space T down down before you finally get it or it looks like they have a shortcut now for alt is it alt o or alt zero okay if you no nope, it's alt zero okay alt zero is the new shortcut so alt zero does it but it is just this button right here new name what do you think icon. Of, what do you think about these new menus um per well for myself personally i always work from the vanilla cinema interface because of live streams and tutorials yeah so along those lines for me the separation is good. Like it makes it very clear to find the icons because they're so delineated. But then I've got the asset browser right in the center, which I really love. It's like such a prominent button, unlike before, where it's kind of like high, you know, kind of tucked away in the corner was this little content browser and it's really squished. And that's like, boom, front and center. What do you want? And you go objects. And oh, here's a little preview. I'm, I'm going to be releasing a couple more. Um, more pasta? Uh, well, I did all the pasta, and I, I really had a lot of fun with the pasta. So now did you make I'm going fusilli? to be. Oh, nice! So, yep, I've got a bunch of dice are going that, to be. The that's next. great. That would have been my. That would have been what I went with to demonstrate the placement tools and like the sh the dynamics and. Like, I had the already modeled drag. these. <laughs> I'd model them and I completely forgot about them. I would have made, wouldn't have made the pasta. But yeah, these are really clean. I even spent a bunch of time uh, doing the UVs on them. So these will be the next one I release on Patreon. Um, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to snap those. Yeah, so they're really cool. I I, I really want to make an augmented reality um, dice bag just to have like at my iPad out when I whenever I can finally get back and play D and D with my friends in person. Yeah. Yeah, I was using uh, the D and D. Uh, beyond and they've had, they've got the dice simulator in there as well did it nice. do you like dnd beyond not just uh, not to side derail too much it's pretty good um it's the first one i've used along those lines so it was getting it was getting used to it a little bit but it does seem to streamline quite a few things um but yeah here's the uh here's a super duper quick demo we've got these dice selected i will create the scatter tool or grab the scatter tool i want to scatter a bunch of dice around so Let's give it some random scale. I want these to be, so we'll have some big dice and some small dice. So anywhere from 50% to 150%. And I'll just paint a bunch. Uh, and there's a bunch of spacing. So I'll say, don't worry about the spacing. So I can create a bunch of dice. Make this editable. 
Oh, and I learned this from Joel Thomas. If you, you I did this so many times, right? Select this and scroll, 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 scroll to select all the children, or you have to select this, right click and find select children. Yeah, it's always hard to find too, but all you have to do is middle mouse button click, boop, and it grabs yeah, all the children. Yeah, just middle mouse. I Same thing to reset parameters to default. Yeah, that one, that one I've known for a few years, but this one I didn't. But anyway, now we've got all these dice selected. I pull them all in the center, <laughs> and now we're using dynamic placement. Let's pull them together. Blurp. This is so cool. This That's is like so when, fun. when they, when this, when I watched the like the the motion show of you going over this, and I was looking at it in the documentation and everything, I was like, this is absolutely insane. Like the fact that they went like full nuts, like with dynamics and time, and you like, it's. It's so like, uh, like other apps have similar features, but they're not like transparently one clickable. Like, I think that's the thing that Maxon does like really exceptionally well is like make things that get out of your way super fast. Like you're like, oh no, I want to do a million dice just like wadded up in a corner. It's like, oh man, how am I going to do that? I guess I'll take a clone or object, turn them in a rigid yeah. body and turn the cube to the side and try to calculate it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's a lot of fun. Although, if, Rick, if you're still listening, literally, it, I would not have, if I was the one designing this tool, I wouldn't have thought of it. But literally every single person who watches a demo of this is like, can I auto keyframe that? I want the motion that I moved to be the final animation. And I, it, I, it seems like you can only do one object. You can keyframe with Cappuccino, a single object, but you can't do all of them. And it seems like every single person wants it. So that is, Max, if you want to make everybody happy, and as I said, as I said I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred to me, but tons of comments on the video and on Twitter and whatnot are just people being like, how can I keyframe this? I want that. Like, I want to take this and... You can record your interaction yeah. while you move with the Mocha or whatever the thing no, is. No, no, that only works with a single object. Uh, oh. Right? Yeah, you guys got to... They have to get that feature. Yeah. I want that. I want that cached. <laughs> yep. And Rick is saying they have heard... So, but yeah, man, it's so fun. God, to, uh, you to play can you with. imagine the trap of like being sitting there with a creative director or an art director, having <laughs> the dice, doing the motion, and and then they're like, "Oh, we love that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Can, can we get a render of that?" And you're like, "I can't recreate it. It's only yeah. been done like it's. It, that's literally the only time it's ever going to happen. I'm sorry." Yeah. <laughs> the um. I, I thought I thought you were going to say the creative director is standing over you. And they're like, oh, can you do it again and have them all land on sixes? It's like, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's not necessarily impossible. Yeah. Well, yeah, you wouldn't do it with this tool. but um, And there would be a lot of follow position. But but actually, well, even along those lines, like I could see people wanting to like, well, yeah, man. I, like to me, the uh, well, them dynamically falling is super powerful. But I just love this like sp like this attraction and uh, separation. Like that right there is like, oh, look at that. But I guess I could see even here, this is why people would want to keyframe that. Like, that wouldn't be easy to set up to be like, blah. Yeah. But, yeah, there'll be... That'll like, be if, that, cool. if that were like, if that had like a live record or like a cache thing, like some sort of cache generator or tag, like if there was a caching system built into cinema and you could just click like a record action button or a record state and then stop it and it just ran, uh, you know, that wouldn't technically be the keyframe. And I know, I know Rick's trying to call me out on keyframes here, but if it's just recording a cache, it's not a keyframe. Uh, and then yesterday, well, I, I'm kind of on the modeling kick right now because I had so much fun modeling up the pasta. So uh, yesterday during the live stream, we modeled this up. This is a, this should be as accurate as, as I could possibly make it a, uh, an ideal diamond. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make a whole collection of gems. Should be, uh, should be super fun. And I'm That's terrible. Cool. I'm terrible at rendering, but here, here's. Uh... Oh, it's an ideal diamond too, so there won't be any like imperfections or anything inside of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The uh, well, and it's, I was learning a bunch of diamond um, terminology with like what they're what they're all called. Like the bottom half is called the pavilion, the top is called the crown. Then you have the girdle and the pavilion top, pavilion bottom. I didn't mean to open up Photoshop, but yeah, here I, with the help of some people who know what they're talking about in red. In Redshift, I uh, gave it the correct index of refraction and everything in Redshift. So, oh, you got some caustics going. Yeah, yeah. It, there's so many steps to make caustics activate in Redshift. Oh my but... god. Yeah, it's it's every time caustics come up on any of the slacks that I'm in, um, I just post the GIF of the Simpsons in during Hurricane Nettie when they're downstairs with the uh, the Rubik's cube, 
And Bart's just like, turn the middle side topwise. Because <laughs> I, I, I have a file saved for uh, Cinema and Houdini just called Caustic Setup, only use. Because I always forget. It's like, oh, this object needs to emit photons. It's probably got to emit like a billion yeah. of them. It, yeah, I have it needs to make a tag, sure. but don't change the setting here. Also, yeah. uh, here's one. I was it was driving me absolutely bananas. I was trying so hard to get caustic to work. At one point, I was like, I was reading up and all these instructions and all that. And I always live inside of the Redshift render view, and caustics won't show up unless you turn on bucket render. Unless and yeah, I you have to be in bucket render. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So I was like trying every setting everywhere and it turned out i just had to turn on bucket rendering but anyway that's a that's a separate <laughs> that's a separate yeah. uh, issue. well subsurface scattering looks completely different in progressive than it does in bucket rendering mode and like different things look different in different modes and can you do the, the viewport redshift with bucket rendering uh well there's now the well, let me open up the diamond file so it's actually a redshift setup um boop and... Oh yeah, Rick. Rick conveniently has a diamond of diamond primitive that's not released yet. Conveniently, yeah, after oh, yeah. you show off that you have well, an upcoming I'm going to beat him drop. to it then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just make sure you sell yours as the real diamond primitive. So here, I don't even know. I mean, here's actually maybe you can explain this because I'm terrible at rendering. Um, so now Redshift is integrated into the viewport and all the settings yeah. everywhere if you own Redshift. So here's start IPR. But is IPR fundamentally a different thing than the render view? Or are they yes. so it's two different flavors of the same thing? Yes, as far as I... Well, yeah, the IPR exists still, but you should always use... The, this is this is the IPR. Yeah. Um, but I... Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure if you could convert this to, to bucket or not. I think it might always be progressive. That's what it looks like. Oh, can you change it right there? Can you just set bucket mode there? Oh, there is bucket mode right there. Completely. Bucket. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, but these settings are, well, is it gonna there's kick? a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, also, is it going to refresh every time I move the mouse? I'll just wait a second. But yeah, it's, it's constructing know. like 2 million photons and prepping oh, there you GI. Go. And, I um, love, this is my favorite pass. I love waiting for the GI pass to calculate. I'm like, ooh, that's a render. <laughs> <laughs> the client you gotta, you this. Your viewport renders. Have you? Oh, so you you're building your Redshift materials via the the new nodes. Well, I've been trying to. There's a couple of limitations. Um, these are not actually. These are these are just with the classic, or the the Redshift Expresso layout. But I've been trying to do the new nodes. But there's a handful of things that don't plug in the way I expect them to, and or limitations. But I have been trying to. Yeah, I've been trying to do that too. Just because I like the new notes so much more, like the, the 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 thing that I thought was missing, which was user data, was apparently there all along. I just plum didn't notice it. <laughs> it was there all along. But yeah, uh, I always spend all my time in the render view. Yeah, render view is basically the. the I mean, that it's you can control the size and everything, and it's it's it's, it's a little. I, I prefer it. Yeah, well, it's just it's separate. It doesn't refresh accidentally. Like you can, I don't know. Just it's a separate thing. Um, let's see. I guess we're reaching the end. Does anybody have any questions specifically about nodes, uh, but more generally about S24 or anything that Casey might be able to help with? Yeah, no keyframes is great. Um, no, fr no keyframe gate. How Los Angeles animator Casey Hupke was blacklisted from the industry. <laughs> um, so, let's see, I'm just scrolling up through the chat, seeing if there's anything. Yeah, it, it looks like we explained everything as perfectly and clearly as possible, and no one has any follow-ups. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, because I had crashed it, let me open up the city thing again. Oh, yeah, I, wanna see, I, I wanted to take a look at that. Do, do, do. S24 tutorial. Oh, that's See a good question, Chop. Thing. Chop asks, how do you both go about the thought process of making an asset with scene nodes? Like, where do you start? Um, as someone who's been making like editable assets inside of cinema for, uh, you know, a long time, um, it usually comes from some, some need. Like, oh, hey, I need to make this thing. Like, you know, like, oh, we need this thing to do this. And the need is usually um, procedural iteration and the ability to use something in as many different places as possible with with uh, with a very minimal amount 
of like error when you update the base object or something. So you don't end up with like a bunch of nulls that are like middle click, connect and delete, copy paste. You know, I always I always try to think like, you know, how can I save time? And if I can save time by building it building it as into an asset of some kind, then that's getting built into an asset, even if it's more time up front. Yeah. And uh, here, I mean, at Rocket Lasso, obviously, we're working on tools. And so, like, user interface and simplicity and paring everything down, logical order, there is there is a lot of complexity to trying and to make a tool that someone else can use without you explaining it a lot. If you're making something for yourself, like, make it quick and dirty, be as organized as you can be. But there is that ratio of you could spend forever being organized. So just getting out the door is good. But... Um, but you know, three weeks from now or three years from now, when you go back to it, you're gonna be like, Oh, why didn't I spend more time and organize it more? Um, oh, I don't yeah. open files that are like eight months old. Honestly, <laughs> if yeah. I, a year old is like, Oh man, what well, what happened on that day? Um, but yeah, this entire setup is pretty fun. And I even, the, I broke things apart into more logical categories. You can see I kind of got a cluster here, a cluster here, and then a cluster here. The, um, but what, yeah, I'm taking... Comment? What's that? Is there oh, a yeah, comment? There, yes, uh, there is. Well, first of all, you can put a comment on any given node, and it's really nice if you do, I think. I can say... Uh, oh, yeah, it's underneath. Yes, one. right. And I think, yeah, if you can click uh, display comment, and then it's going to actually show up there, which is really nice. Right, that's uh, how you do it. Yeah, so yeah, everything can be commented specifically. Um, and then actually, yeah, I think, yeah, even there, you just, it's like, oh, there is a note, but you can sort of hide it. So that's a that's a nice detail. But yeah, uh, this is taking in raw geometry from the object manager, and this is doing a series of modifications on it to randomize it. So it's going from the grid, and I'm doing a lot of like delete random polygons, retriangulate, delete more, subdivide, and smooth. Um, and I've got a couple like uh, loop carried values here, so like it's doing a loop of smoothing iterations and whatnot. And that eventually outputs this geometry, which is this, which becomes the basis to start generating additional things. And up here is all the road and river generation. So let's see if I have geometry outputs anywhere. Well, here's one, so I can output that. So this should be the, yeah, here's the pass of roads and the rivers are missing. And that's because the rivers, yeah, here's where the rivers come out. Hopefully that works. Ah, maybe it's the same layout, but anyway, this all this all gets fed through. But I building your own little assets, like I do it. I I'm do I find myself doing it pretty often. This this split selection is one that I made. Oh, that took a while to update. Um, but yeah, here's it's taking the rivers. Yeah, you know, all this is procedurally made, like just with nodes. Um, but uh, I find myself all the time, like I, I have a current selection, like something is selected and I want to split it out into two different selections. So I immediately made this group. I didn't make an asset. I just made a group. And inside of it, it's just doing something very simple, which is taking the geometry currently selected and deleting it and taking the geometry, inverting it and deleting it and outputting two separate pieces of geometry. But those three nodes combined are going to be repeating themselves over and over and over again. So by creating it, I have a, like I made a split all. And then down here, I made a hybrid version, which is, is taking it and doing its own randomizing. So inside of this, I'm taking in one piece of geometry and then it is randomly selecting half and then taking each of those halves and randomly selecting half again and now putting twice. I could have just done it once and fed it in three times, but building those little assets for yourself, I do it because it saves time and I was copying and pasting a bunch of times. So, and eventually yeah. I could save this as a modeling operation and then it would be yeah. really quick to search and drag in. Right now I just have been copying it throughout the scene. So yeah, it's just more when you find a need for it. And then, yeah, eventually all this stuff gets fed through. Like I and know that one of the first ones that I'm going to build soon is just like vert, um, split vertex to split vertex links with like a whole handful of switches in the middle of like different like options for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that's one of the things, like once you start getting into like matrix operations and stuff, you just end up with these like, big chunks of like nine nodes that are just like oh i gotta collapse those fast <laughs> yeah well yeah just like you saw when i'm if you want to offset just y you have to take things split it into their components recombine them and then any changes you made live in the middle but really you're inputting geometry outputting geometry so that could all get collapsed into one yeah the, um, 
but yeah and then i mean what's really fun here is eventually i had like a road object a river object and i've got the plots of land object that gets fed in here which split it into four pieces and those four pieces get fed into building type two building type one this is just plots of grass here's building type four and then, yeah, I have several different types. I even have this tree generator. So once again, this is all just this original thing. I think in the scene, no, I built, I did build it. It's just a cone and a cylinder, but I can also pipe in this and this material, we didn't really talk about, it, but this material operator, which you can just search for, you know, material. And there's your material operation. And once you mm -hmm. make a material operation, it looks exactly like a, uh, your normal material tag. But now yeah. I can, so this is applying the materials to the geometry. I can output that into the final hierarchy of that. And this will now generate, it's going to take a little bit because there's a lot, but now I'm generating all of these trees throughout the entire scene as well. And it's, and these are only being generated where there were grass. And I'm even doing that manually, but where there's a process where it's taking all the remaining plots of land and then subdividing it. And they're appearing on different subdivisions of the grass layout. So that's where you'll see, like right now I have it all turned on, but right here, if I look at it, it looks pretty random, but that's actually generating one in the center of that polygon. But this one happened to get the subdivided into two polygons. But yeah, each part can be output separately, do whatever you want. So I could then take just the river layer and start doing more things to just the river. I could take the road layer and start going deeper and trying to get like road lines through the center, maybe potentially generate splines that are where the roads are traveling. So maybe I could generate some sort of automatic traffic there's a lot of places this type of thing can go, and this is just me having fun. And you got you got to have a a check for like that's where that's where I hope that uh, scripting comes along at some point for just for adding a little bit of an advanced nature to it. So you can be like, oh, you know, if if building density is blank, then uh, subway, and it goes oh. under the map. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, it's not like we couldn't do that. You know, just directly via the nodes. I don't think there's we a could, Python no, we, node or anything, but no, there's no Python node. Uh, I don't you can just get it. like an array length. I could just be like, oh, output every point. It's like, oh, well, you've got this many points. You've got this many polygons. Like, oh, I've got over this amount. Make this thing happen. Yeah, but that would be cool. Like, add subways in because it's like, oh, well, this is downtown, or yeah. like uh, overpasses that need to occur because too many roads are going to collide. <laughs> the um. The thing, the thing I'm really wanting is uh, more things need to be turned. They ha have to be able to be fed arrays because right now a lot of things cannot be fed arrays. The primary one being the extrude. Like the extrude has a random variation, but I want to control per polygon what it is yeah. because if that was the case, I could just and that's exact same way where you just made that null that had the that was pushing everything up in the center. In that way, I could take a null and it'd say, "Hey, the closer to the null that this is, make the buildings be taller." And so you could build fall offs for exactly where the downtown area should be, and then even have different plots of geometry appear. But right now, the extrude doesn't do that. So yeah, as as the different tools become you know, capable of being fed arrays and whatnot, then it's going to really open up a lot of possibilities. Is that strictly because it can't be... F well, yeah, I guess it's only... Right now it can because... be fed... It can't be fed an array. It can be fed a single value. And, or a random. But the random... I mean, that the random shows proof of concept that each polygonal extrusion can carry its oh, own yeah. They just didn't value. build it in a way that allowed it to input an array, but it could be built that way. So that's just hopefully the next pass. I think a lot of the tools right now are not, some of them are, but I think the, all the tools are not necessarily being built for taking full utilization of the nodes. It's more like, oh, let's let's quickly look through the menus of cinema. Uh, oh, we have an extrude. Oh, we have an inset. Just they, like take it and directly translate it one-to-one -one instead of it being the newer version. So as yeah. as they get updated and become more uniform, I expect all those different tools to get uh, get that power applied. Yeah, this is just where we're at in this, in this version of the preview. God, can you imagine building all these individual ops? Being like, okay, now I'm building this op. Uh, I got I to expose this parameter and this parameter and this parameter. I got to expose this <laughs> parameter. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. But building up your own tools for that. I mean, it's amazing. Cause essentially, this concept is built off of a, a city generator I had been prototyping. So I kind of, in my head, I already knew the steps to build this type of thing. But I was doing it with code. And I did get further than this. But like, I think this would be something like 3,000 lines of code 
to do this because so many things had to be done from scratch. But in that I was doing, I, I was writing code that enabled me to search for, the, uh, you know, I could feed it a percentage and be like, give me the largest 20% of polygons. And I could subdivide those largest polygons again, or find the smallest polygons mm. and get rid of them. I could build those nodes here where I could build an iteration to go through, check every polygon, get the largest one and build a node that would be a selection tool that's, hey, grab any polygon larger than X or grab any polygon that is in the top 20% or the smallest 20% or select any polygon that has a five that is part of a, uh, what, what's the word? You, you, the poll, you, when there's a poll, so you want, you know, you don't want five poles or more. So you could say, hey, select any point that has five or more poles and then dissolve it and triangulate it. So like as you build those tools up, and I don't expect Maxon to build those specific tools because they're very specific to what they do, but I could build yeah. those. And then I could- I wouldn't want them to build those tools either because yeah. like there's no guarantee that, 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 that they're, unless it was editable. Like that's yeah. the whole, that's the whole point. To like I want, I want yeah. to be able to modify and build my own version of those. I was just looking at your scene and I was like, oh man, I can already see like uh, calculating distance to make like, okay, so that, this is a big building. This needs three AC units on the roof. Yes. <laughs> this is a small building. It needs an AC unit on the window. This is well, a building yeah. that only has a chimney. <laughs> well, and the cool part being that, you know, I could have each of these buildings, or like right now, these are just some simple extrudes, but I could extrude them. And then at the last step, split that roof off to a separate object. So it's like, oh, here's the building's walls, here's the building's roof. Now I could make a, a rooftop object and now do things just to all the rooftops. And it could be a rooftop object that is now separate from the individual buildings, but all collectively every single roof, and then do analysis on those individual polygons and do different things on top of each one, colorize them differently. Like there's so many crazy possibilities. That's why, I, I, to me, doing the city generation is just like, okay, this will flex the muscles of everything the system can do. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Really, really fun. Uh, okay. Well, we're about at time, everybody. Let's check the chat one last time and see if there's anything to wrap up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Uh, Rick just mentioned, I just got to remember where it is. Oh, maybe that's only once it was output as a final object and obviously this is not going to show up in the scene nodes because I did not build it in that way oh yeah it's not here but before the only way to essentially make the geometry real was you could export as a lembic and then rebring it back in again right but I think in the there's now if you're if you did build it and it was showing up here I'll just show it in the most basic of ways and send it to we, legacy or whatever yeah, well, not set to, well, yes, yeah, pretty much. We do that and I'll extrude it, modify, extrude. And let's see if we, can we right click to get it? No, but well, it's here somewhere. He oh, says node, e node, node editor, edit menu. menu. Edit. Oh, uh, yeah, C uh, current state current to, scene to classic. Cla current state to classic. There All we right, go. I don't know what will happen right now, but I'm gonna click it. Let's see. Do we have selection yeah. tags and all that stuff? Well, it, what the, well, that's a one shot. It's done that one time now as a single execution. And it's probably also outputting this. I'm going to say don't output that anymore. But now you see that it's gone and created a entire stack of this. And this is actually what I was outputting. So you can see a bunch of instances. These are probably all those trees that I was creating. And up here is Gosh. all the different bits of geometry. So no materials, though, or selections. Uh, no, they're... Oh, they're there. Oh, they're just all the way over there. Oh, yeah. cool. That's great. Yeah, some of the crazy names came in. Actually, I'm not seeing materials. It's not to say that they're not applied. Maybe it didn't convert the materials, but but no, I mean, it's still material here. So this must be... I, I'm not sure, but I turned off the node. The so this is the just the, the geometry. The trees have materials. Yeah, so something came through. I'm not sure what all this geometry is. Maybe those don't get output. Oh, yeah, these are hidden. So maybe those aren't... Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a big complicated hierarchy here. Oh yeah, there they are. Haha. So yeah, there's like the river. Oh, it, it's they're coming in as instances, which is interesting. But yeah, I could make this editable, and yeah, there's my actual river geometry. So it's now become real in the scene. So it's not like this is useless. Like it's I know it's not production ready because things might change, things might break, and you know things are not complete. And there's some there's some little quirks oh, yeah. and bugs in it. But it's not to say that will. It could be they useful. will change and break. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've tried to open up one of the files that you made on the last time we did this. 
oh, it, yeah, probably won't even, it probably won't work. Yeah, definitely some nodes changed from before. And even just like one, I mean, and seriously, if they change one node, this entire setup might break and I won't know where it is. So as it gets more mature, then these will get locked in and they won't change. But yeah, right now, if this newly created node, if they change the way it works, and it's like, oh, it, it's no longer old and new. Instead, it's like feeding in geometry and it's turning on a checkbox. Everything will break because that's not the way I built my rig. So that, yeah. that's why it's not production ready yet. But that's not to say it isn't you know, completely ready to be played with and to start learning the process. Uh, but even yeah. the process, we expect to change. Scene manager going up and set it down. Etc. <laughs> oh, it has to. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that when they released the C manager going from bottom to top, that was just an accident, and uh, that they're they're are they're, they're diligently at work making sure that it works, you know, exactly as cinema has worked for the last you know uh, 17 years or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Rick still hasn't confirmed when Cinema 40 is dropping on the M1 iPad, but uh, Rick, go ahead and chime in anytime when we're getting iPad Cinema. <laughs> Oh man, that would be just like the coolest thing. I would love, love to be able to play with an I sit them on my iPad. But wouldn't that wouldn't that just be as a goof though? Like, would you be able to do any actual work if it has the look? So the new iPad has the M1 chip that's inside of oh, sure. the, oh, the no, MacBook the M1 Air. chip's amazing. But the point being which, is interacting with your fingers or even a I guess I'm using a pen on like an iPad Pro. Use a pen, and you can something. plug it. You can also plug it. You can also just take your keyboard and mouse that's Bluetooth, and just put it on your iPad and use it as a laptop. I mean, that's funny. It's still ridiculous. It's I, I mean, it, it more is of a ridiculous that the technology anything, is there. It's ridiculous that we could that it's actually a thing that we could do. That's true. That's true. I mean, the the, the iPad Pro's twelve point nine inch case has a trackpad on it. Like it's so close to just like being a laptop. I mean, I'd rather travel with that if it were actually a, a, a thing. Like if I were going to, um, you know, NAB one day soon. One day. I would absolutely just rather ha like walk around with my laptop to like tinker on stuff or work on my presentation. And, you know, that's, I think it'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. I can see, yeah, making tweaks to the presentation as you go. The um, Or even pairing it. Like there's that Adobe stuff that pairs with the iPad. So oh, it could be interesting. Uh, and yes, uh, Pro Tools, thank you. Uh, as a heads up, uh, Noseman is going to be joining me next week. He'll probably, again, be like some of the new feature stuff, but he's also an expert and very, very technical in cinema overall, so we might be able to just take general questions. Uh, thanks for joining me, man. It was really fun just talking nodes, working, uh, bumbling our way through different parts of it. Um, I'm yeah. excited for the future of it, but um, thanks for coming and joining me as a guest. No, this was wonderful. Um, yeah, you get to hang out with Noseman next week. That sweet, sweet voice. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I think that will wrap this up, everyone. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube if you're not. Uh, another big heads up. Uh, because I've been doing these streams that are a little more timely with these guests, I've been kind of posting them right away. But generally, I don't repost the replay of these until a week later. I post them right away on Patreon. But... Make sure when you go to the YouTube channel, at the top, I've got the Rocket Lasso Archive channel as well. It's a completely separate channel because I don't want to I don't want to spam the main like tutorial one with all the replays. So there are two different channels. Make sure you subscribe to both. Otherwise, you won't be seeing all the content. And uh, yeah, because we crashed, there's no scene files here. But typically on these live streams, any scene files I get created would be available on Patreon as well. But that is going to wrap this up. Thanks again, man, for joining me. And I hope to see you in person soon. Besides yeah, that, me too. Uh, besides that, uh, thanks everybody, and I'll see everyone next week. Oh yeah, thanks Rick for chat support. Oh yeah, and big big thanks to Rick for doing everything he could to keep us on track here. <laughs> so that'll do it. Bye bye everybody. See ya.